Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVMLP Asheville, 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org. The voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com, for more on Walter's music. Thank you, Devine Dial, for managing WPVM-FM in downtown Asheville, and Robin Collier for managing KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, coming out of Taos, New Mexico. If you'd like to reach out to me, Nave at jamesnave.com. Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. And I'd like to remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you'd like to improve your writing chops, imaginativestorm.com is a good place to, to go and look. So today I have a new friend on. We've never met in person. We've only met in Zoom. She's based in Asheville, North Carolina. Her name is Mildred Baria, and she's a professor at UNCA. That's the University of North Carolina at Asheville, as well as an active poet, published poet, a woman of letters. She loves literature and poetry. So I've also invited her to be part of a writing gathering that's going to happen at Lake Eden. It's called the the Lake Eden Writing Retreat, and that's going to be in May. Mildred, welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm glad that you agreed to join me, and I'm looking forward to meeting you very soon when I come to Asheville. So, Mildred, you're a poet, you're a writer. How do you interact with your creative thoughts as you move through your ordinary day? Mm, That's a great question to ask. So a few years ago, I think my interaction with art and creating and creativity used to happen in the nighttime when it's quiet and everybody has gone to sleep. Because now I have been teaching full time the last seven years, I just realized that the nighttime wasn't working well for me. So I switched into early morning to be the first thing I do when I wake up and put my feet on the ground, have a little meditation and put myself in the zone of creating. Then I report to my desk, have a cup of coffee and start writing before I check email, before I look at social media or anything. I have the first three hours of my morning undisturbed and also not thinking about the world and what could be happening out there. And then after that, that's when I'm able to engage and read emails and see what I need to respond to. And I find that that has been really very good for me because I feel like I am able to listen to my thoughts. I'm able to know what's emerging because I'm quiet and I'm also cultivating that space before the writing begins. I get ideas and also realize that there is always something to write. The art is always really there within me. If I create time, then it comes out. Early morning ended conversations about the writer's blog because I don't believe that today exists. Once you create time, you will have so many ideas to write. And you realize that once, even if you have a hundred years, you could never exhaust the source. So that's how I engage with my creativity. And then by the time I show up in the classroom, because I've already been in touch with it, I'm able to just keep going. I'm able to teach and and introduce students really to, first of all, the discipline and craft of writing, but also how to carve time in their busy lives and engage with art, because that's basically what I do in my own life. And so I find there's a way my engagement with creativity feeds my teaching practice. And also sometimes what happens in the classroom ends up coming back into my writing practice. You use the word report when you said you get up in the morning, you have your coffee. I report to my desk as if Mm -hmm. your desk has some kind of contract with you. I have to go report to work. Could you speak more about the idea of reporting to one's desk rather than just simply being creative? That's a good point. You're such a great listener. (laughs) I'm so glad you're raising this issue because what happens sometimes um, when I get up, 
And yes, I do use the word reporting to work because sometimes that's exactly what I say to myself. I will speak it out loud. I will have my cup of coffee, my mug, and I'll be moving to my desk and I'll say, Mildred Badia, reporting to work. And it's like, that turns me on. So I actually say it, <laughs> which I think is a little bit weird, you know, but it's, yes, I'm coming into work. And I don't know why it's something beautiful to me to hear and I guess it's because I take my creativity seriously. Yes, it is creating, it is playing, but it is also essential in the sense that I really must do that. If I don't do it, it's almost like I don't exist or a part of me isn't alive. So they're reporting to work. It's not actually to make work sound mechanical. It's more like I am ready. I am here. I am on purpose. I'm doing this. Yeah, I've heard some stories of poets, writers, creative people saying, the muse comes to me every day at 9 a.m. when I sit down in my office at my desk, and the muse leaves me at 5 p.m. when I take my hat off the rack, put it on my head, and walk out the door. So right. in some ways, that's the idea of reporting to the desk. Yes, also, you said there's no such thing as writer's block. I'm in that camp as well. Mm -hmm. Could you put together reporting to the desk and why you think there's no such thing as writer's block? Can you build that out a little bit? Yes, I can build that because when you report to work or to the desk and you're able to get quiet, to begin with silence, because I feel like everything actually begins in silence, creation begins or maybe stems from silence, then what to write comes. And people who are working directly on the computer, you may stare at a blank screen. So there is nothing there. But because you've quieted your mind, things naturally will start to happen because I, I do believe I'm tying this to the to also the concept that nature abhors a vacuum. So once there is a vacuum, which is the white screen, nature resists that. It wants words on that screen or on that blank page. So things will start to come into your mind and you start writing. The first couple of sentences may not be what you want, but the point is to get started. And once you get started and you're doing that, you're typing for the first two minutes, three minutes, five, by the time you really reach five minutes, something clearer will emerge. It could be an image that then anchors what you're writing. If you're working on a poem, we work with images all the time. And W.C. Uh, Williams said that no idea but in things. So once you have a thing, which is an image, then all the ideas start to really come and surround that image. And once you have that, the block, whatever you had thought of as a block or a blank page are no longer blank and the block is no longer there. Now you're creating and that can go on for hours. And then the next day, there will be something new to do. And sometimes even when you're not creating fresh and by fresh, I mean looking at a blank page, you may then read what you wrote yesterday trying to get into the spirit of it and to see if there is somewhere to revise. And once you do that, then you may find that there are other ideas connected to what you've just written or what you've written. There might be sentences that need strengthening. So the writing of the first draft and the revision of the second or third draft, all those are part of the creative process. It's still creating. And when you keep doing that, you really, for me, what happens is that I realize that I can't actually process all the ideas that I imagine. I have to make choices because I can't write as fast as the ideas come. And I have been asking the universe to make me go faster, <laughs> but that doesn't happen because it's like, don't be a glutton. Eat what you need to get full right now. Tomorrow, there will be more food. And the next day, there will be more food rather than thinking that, oh, my gosh, if I don't eat all this food, it's going to go, which is what sometimes happens to writers. They think if you don't start typing away and, and do everything that's coming to you, 
you're going to lose it. The muse is no longer going to come. It's like, uh-uh, the muse is actually always there. It knows your pace. It knows your speed. So if you honor what has come to you today, even if you get five other ideas that you're not going to pursue, the next day there will be more ideas and the next day there will be more to pursue. You're suggesting spirituality here in many ways as I listen to what you're talking about, because on the physical plane, mm -hmm. we do experience scarcity. A lot of people in the world right now are experiencing scarcity. What you're suggesting within the realms of creativity, that's one place where there is no scarcity. So can you speak a bit around the spiritual nature of this abundance that you're talking about that's always there for you? It's really coming from recognition that I don't separate my spirit from my body or from my mind. I feel like there is always this integration, maybe not always, but it's just that I wouldn't know where the spirit begins and ends. While the body, I can say, yes, I'm five feet three, you know, it begins here, it's this tall, it's this big. So the body can actually be measured, which probably is why in terms of physicality, some things can be measured. Some people can have more and other people will have less. But when it comes to the spiritual world or spiritual being, we all have really the same. And what I would like to know is, if this is the way things are, if the spiritual world is this abundant and rich, isn't there a way of making the physical life abundant and rich too? Because the spirit is always feeding the physical. But I haven't figured out how to actually do that because I don't think we are only rich in spirit and poor physical resources. I feel like since everything begins in spirit, then that richness should facilitate a physical richness. But there is a disconnect there. There is a separation. And that is what for me bothers me because I feel like there shouldn't be a separation. There shouldn't be a disconnect because we are still the same people. You know, if I'm the person who is abundant creating, why wouldn't I be abundant? in creating physical resources, for instance. So probably somewhere I limit myself. It is possible that there is a switch <laughs> that I could turn on that then opens the floodgates of the physical world and brings in these riches. But I don't know where that switch is. I'll be honest, I have no idea. Or if it's even a switch. I mean, these people, the shamans, when you want rain, when when there's drought in a village, we used to have the rainmakers and they actually made rain. If they could go into their spirit and make rain fall so that the communities don't starve, the gardens have rain. If they could do that, they provided a physical resource, which is rain in the spirit form, which is the creativity. And I don't want to complicate this because it should be simple, but this is how I think. Well, let me ask you this. In your search for that switch, do you notice that's a driver for your creativity that propels you to get up and report to that desk? What's there that makes that happen? That's a great question. I think that has always been there because when I look back from the time I was aware of my existence, maybe four years, five years, I ran out of my own books. And so I started reading my siblings' books, searching for this, you know, because the world of literature was and storytelling was fascinating to me. And I always sat with the elders back home. I grew up in the village in Kavali. I would sit with the elders because they, they had incredible stories. I really wanted the stories. And then when I learned to write, I started making up things and writing letters to pen posts that I didn't really have. But in my mind at that age, I was writing to, you know, imaginary characters and that becoming my world. Put the letters under my pillow because I had nowhere to send them, you know, but I was describing my world, what I ate, and, you know, really talking to your character. This was talking to your characters, but I didn't know that's what it's called. 
until much later, I, I took a fiction class and I learned that that's how fiction writers, they create characters, they talk with their characters, they get to know. And I was like, oh, I think I was born knowing how to do that, but I didn't even know it's a thing. Like, this is something you can do. And like adults do that because I thought I was doing it because I'm a child and, you know, I have time. I'm not burdened with responsibilities as adults. So when I realized that adults can actually choose to do that, to talk with their characters and create them and put them in books and sell the books, I was like, oh, this is what I want to do because it was there. It was natural for me. I did that and why at some point I tried to move away from it because it wasn't putting food on, on my table. And I was like, how can I love something so much that doesn't feed me? Again, talk about physical scarcity. It's like I have this thing. It has always been with me and it's not enabling me to live off it, which probably a lot of artists face when they can create incredible artwork, but they don't make so much money from their art unless they are, you know, there are a few people who do that, a few artists who actually break through. But a lot of artists don't, they have to find another, like they have to do something else. So then I became a psychologist and, and then I made money. Then the psychology paid my bills and, and everything. And then in the night I would still try to write. And then one time I decided to stop writing. I was like, first of all, this thing doesn't really feed me. Let me stop writing. It didn't take more than three months of not writing, but I remember really becoming so sad, so miserable. And I realized that, oh, this thing may not give me food, may not feed me, but it's actually giving me something else. It's it's keeping me connected to joy. It's uplifting. It's It makes me happy. And if it makes me happy, it has done its job. And then once I accepted that, I was back to writing because I did try not to write just to say, to say like, I no longer want to be an artist. I no longer want to do this thing. And quickly, people started noticing that I was becoming something else. So they started asking, have you written lately? Have you been writing? You know, they were sensing something is over. I said, no, I, I'm not writing. And then I realized I was becoming a danger to everyone around me, including myself. And I was like, okay, never do this again. You will always create. Because if you don't do that... First of all, you won't like yourself and nobody will actually like being around you. Sometimes the school semester will get so busy, there'll be so much to do and I'll miss two days or three days without writing. And I'll start to feel really antsy. I'll start to feel it. I was like, oh, I need to write. And so I tell people, I said, you know what? I'm not going to meet with you. I need to write because you don't want to see what I will be if I show up before I've written. So now I honor that. I know that at least for me, it's something I must do because it nourishes my spirit. It may not liberate me from doing a million other things in terms of physical or material resources. It does really keep me happy and engaged and and playing. Yeah, I love to play, to play with words and language. So once I'm playing, I feel like that's all I need in life. I've never heard anyone say I'll be dangerous if I don't write. So I love that concept of nurturing the goodness in oneself by writing to avoid having the danger emerge. I am curious, when you were young and you sat with the shamans, and we hear the word shaman a lot in our Western culture. Oh, you're a shaman. Oh, this shaman, that shaman. So it's overused quite a bit. You sat with people who were practicing a tradition that's ancient. Do you think this danger that you're talking about is connected to the wisdom the shamans gave you? They maybe said you'll be dangerous if you don't practice your true nature, your true art. What did you learn from the shamans? And can you help us understand your view of what it means to be a shaman? That's a very good question. And I honestly hadn't connected to whether the shamans helped me to always create so that 
I'm not a danger. I hadn't seen it through the lens of the shamans. But what they told me or what I learned from them was that these were ordinary people in my village. We didn't actually, while we knew that they were shamans, we respected them as elders because most of them were really old, you know, like in their 60s and 70s. But I was young, I was a child, so everybody who was an adult is probably, <laughs> I, I I aged them more than their, their actual years. But anyway, they looked older, they were older, they were my father's friends, they would come home. So while we knew their power in the spirit world, and also we went to them when we were sick, and you know, they would look at you or touch you or make a small cut somewhere and your will. I still don't understand that. But while they did these amazing things, they never stopped from being ordinary members of the community. They would go to their gardens and work. You know, they they worked in the gardens. Some of them had goats. They reared goats. So they did everything. You know, they had wives and, and children. So they were normal. They also didn't charge fees for being shamans. You brought them a gift. You took them a chicken, you took them sogam or millet, you took them porridge, you gave them something because that's how it worked. That if you go to, to these medicine men and shamans and medicine women, you don't pay because that's an insult. You're grateful because everything they did was in the service of their gifts, their art. So they don't charge because that's something that's come from God. You don't charge for that. So they lived on on what everybody lived on, which is gardening, having a garden, having cows. They had other businesses and they did this. So I saw that and that for me is what confirmed to me that they were true shamans. Because right now, there are some people who call themselves shamans and I don't trust them because they, they charge exorbitant fees, first of all. True shamans in my culture don't ask for money. So these ones who are saying they will cure all these illnesses and whatever, I, I have a hard time really believing them because they, they are all about physical riches, you know, like you pay them. And maybe they are doing that because they are trying to live off being shamans rather than having gardens, having goats, like rather than doing other things. But in my world, I feel like, uh-uh. These are not practicing what the the elders and the shamans thought. So one thing I, I really learned from them was that they were ordinary people. And that has never left me. So even when I meet artists and I know that I'm creating, and, and sometimes, you know, depending on where you go, people are like, oh, yeah, right, are you do this? You know, they want to hold you in, in highest esteem or highest regard. And I remember that I'm just a human being, you know? Yeah, the art is there, but... That doesn't elevate me above everyone else or anybody else. It, it's just a gift that I have. Do you think as you move toward being an elder, you're not there at all now, an elder, as I understand it, would be someone who was older, 60, 70. As you move in that direction of wisdom, of being an elder, do you think people will start to regard you as a shaman? Perhaps we don't regard ourselves as shamans. Others regard us as that, and then that's how we become the shaman. Do you think that might happen to you? Do you see that happening now even? You don't have to be old to have this wisdom. Right. We have these sayings that be kind of become cliches about being a wise soul. Or, or So I was always told, you know, even in school, like, oh, you, you really have an old woman in you. Or you have a wise soul. So I've had that said, but I, I didn't really like connect it. Like, oh, it's because I'm a shaman, an upcoming shaman. I mean, that would be ridiculous. I don't know what will happen in my older years and what people will call me. I, I really have no idea. What I know I'll be doing is that I'll be creating and making art. So... Maybe people will call you a shaman. And if they do, I suspect you will accept that name graciously and say thank you very much. And then you will get on to, with your poetry and your art, which brings me around to something that you told me earlier before we started this interview. You have a manuscript on your desk and you yes. just finished writing some poetry. So my goodness, you're a poet and you have new work. Would you give us a few pieces or to... Would you read some poetry for us? 
I would like to. I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much for asking. And I think I'll actually just read the first poem that is the first poem in the manuscript. And it's, I won't say anything about it other than saying the title is My House. To weave risk and beauty in a fragile balance, my house firm and delicate as a spider's home. I wish for myself a house made of spidery webs, each thread mirroring a path I have taken and others I am yet to take, each spin leading to a room with many windows to see monarch butterflies and guest wings for my family and friends. I pray that my house will be open and airy, indestructible in its elegance and lightness. I do not wish for permanence, but what's durably suspended in eternal presence, the way pollen grasps bodies of strangers on their walks. The spider at work hangs precariously over a cliff, water trickling beneath as though unaware of the danger, perhaps even inspired by it, invisible to travelers jumping over rocks on their way to the meadows. Beautiful. You go from the home to the cliff, to the tiny spider, to the great crevasse, to the stream below that likely will catch the spider and float it to the sea, and you bring danger into the mix all at the same time i'm listening to a well-crafted poem obviously you didn't just kick that out on a napkin you've thought through and i can hear when you read it the first time it's worthy of reading many 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 times because it has the layering that one hopes for in a poem open mm -hmm. one little bit of layering and then there's another and another and another and on it goes Thank you. When you wrote that piece, how did it start? And what approach did you take to craft it to its final form, which is now ready to go meet the world in the manuscript that you have on your desk? How it started is that I was hiking. I went on a hike and I did come across a spider and a web. It was building the web and it was already a huge round web and some flies were getting caught in it. And there was a rock, it was time to pause in my hike. So I wanted to eat my sandwich. So I sat next to this spider continuing to spin, eating my sandwich and, and then watching it. And then I realized, oh, the spider is at home. This is its home. And from it, it's able to catch food or bring in food but also because of, of the surroundings I've described, uh, you know, having hanging over a cliff, you know, where you see, it's amazing where spiders actually choose to build. Sometimes it's just in the air. So anything can happen, can crush the web, which is its house. And then it's, that sent me imagining what it would be like for me at least to live with impermanence, with this idea that, there's nothing permanent, even your house can be swept away. And we see this happening in terms of floods, in terms of hurricanes, in terms of tornadoes, but it shocks us because we think that a building is permanent, the structure is firm. Forget that, no, it isn't. And like, be okay with that. Reconcile with the idea of impermanence and temporariness, things ending those changes in the dangers, but also in the beauty, because I do admire what spiders do. Some of their webs look incredibly intricate and beautiful. When I go into nature, mm -hmm. I sense permanence within the impermanence. Yeah. The spider's there for a season, then the spider goes away and all this left, a few yeah. little remnants of the web. You are drawn to nature clearly. It informs your thinking. I know this because you told me that once, and I also know it because I could hear it in the poem you just read. You started out with a sensibility of impermanence, 
around your permanent home because I had the feeling that it was a beautiful web like the ones we see with the spiders. What makes the spider's web permanent is not the web. It's the urgency that the spider naturally has to make the web. The web will always be there. It's tied to the idea that there's no such thing as writer's block. There's no such thing as spider block or web building mm -hmm. block. The spider just like makes the web in the air. Talk about your relationship to nature and how that informs your work and how you are able to introduce that to newcomers. And I'm thinking of the students at UNCA, the newcomers who show up at your class because they were required to take it or they picked it as an option. How do you deal with nature and its meaning? It's a source of inspiration for me. Maybe because when I go into nature, I do get, just like reporting to work, to my desk, I do get ideas. I do see things in a new way. And I also just find it beautiful. You know, especially this, well, every place is beautiful, depending on, on, on perspective and lens. But when I look at the mountains in, in Nashville and I go on a trail and we have a lot of waterfalls, I can stand and stare at a waterfall for three hours, just admiring it, seeing the flow, seeing where the water forms and, and, and where it's crystal clear and how it's going over rocks or pebbles, you know. All that, I just find that this is really a beautiful thing. But what is making it beautiful is the fact that water is doing its job. The, the waterfall is flowing. That's what it's supposed to do. It does make me wonder if I'm doing what I'm here to do. Because if each one of us did what we are here to do, we would be flowing. We would have the flow. We would feel that. And I think a lot of the angst that happens and the struggles is that we find ourselves not doing what we are here to do. I, I go to nature for those lessons and reminders and, and also just for the plain beauty that is in nature. I see nowadays on my trail, the one I go to often, there's a lot of deer. I think we've established a relationship now when I come into the path, when I'm running or just walking on the trail, I will see the bugs, and the bugs used to be farther away. The doors could come closer, but the bugs would always run. Now I will see the bugs, sometimes three of them, sometimes only one, right near the trail, and they won't move. And then they will actually come closer, and they put one, like one foot <laughs> forward, and then they lift their heads. And then I do the same. I put my foot forward, and then I lift it. It's like a greeting. It's like they nod at me, and then I know. And then they move forward again, you know, one step closer and I do the same, but I do it so gently so that I don't even make a sound. Them, And I can just see the hairs around their faces and I can stretch my hands and touch them. And that amazes me. They are not afraid of me. They, they recognize that I'm one of them, <laughs> clearly. And then the doors, they, they come closer, very close. One of them gave birth last year. Clearly this door knows that this is a safe place for it. And so things like that, maybe they are ordinary, yes, maybe they happen every day. I tend to see something more in them that, oh, this could be a way of living, you know, in communion with all nature, in trust, because I do believe these animals trust me. I am still aware that some animals are you know, can be dangerous. We do have black bears. So I'm not going to hug a bear on the trail. I still have the, the sense to tell me that, please don't do that. I, I will see them. And so we keep a safe distance, but they see me and we see them. So I don't go to them the way I move with the deer. Getting back to your question, what I get from nature, it's, it's really to rebuild the connection and the trust that I think our ancestors actually had, or the people who used to live in the forest, they had all that. They knew they were hunters and gatherers, but they also knew not to kill every animal just for consumption. And they also knew that these animals could kill them. So there was an understanding, you know, they had to establish boundaries and also but there was a, a big sense of respect 
I feel like we've departed from that because we've brought in this idea of dominion and control and killing animals recklessly. And that doesn't go well with me because I feel like, why would you do that when these animals have their agency? Like they, they want you to trust and to have this. When you go into the classroom or when you come to a workshop event like the one we're doing in May, the Lake Eden Writing Retreat, and you encounter students, some of whom are advanced and others are just beginning. What is your approach? How do you introduce yourself and your ideas to these students in ways that will excite them the way you have been excited by all of the experiences you've had artistically? I encourage them to use their senses. Sometimes we don't all have five senses, but most people have five senses, sight, touch, taste, smell, hear. A lot of nature, what it requires is really to listen. So to encourage that you already have the tools to begin writing. Even if you didn't know a thing about the craft of writing a poem or even a short story, and you just wrote something based on how you're seeing it, how you're smelling it, if you touch it, what's the texture? Can you describe that texture to somebody who isn't close so that they can actually feel it, they can see it? And also, can you, if you were to eat it, like what would it be? taste like. So once I do that, they do get excited because they realize they have so much they can describe. They have they have everything. And then the craft, the imagery, or the sound or other figures of speech, those can come in later. And and also one one exercise I really like and that I do myself and, and never fails to produce incredible work is to write a poem for somebody who cannot see, you know, for somebody who is blind. Then that forces uh, the students to even go beyond their senses because you're not going to rely on sight. If the person doesn't see, describing things based visually isn't actually going to be helpful. So you find that you're relying more maybe on, on texture, on touch, because the, the person who, who is blind is likely to touch and feel that makes you think through, really through the sense of touch, how you might describe how, a, first of all, an apple might feel, and then when you eat it, how it would taste, and how based on the on the touch and the taste, it can appeal to the person who can see it, but gets the sense of wholeness that's coming from you utilizing these other senses. And so that is always helpful because students are like, oh, okay, I do have the senses. Once in a while, I'll be surprised when somebody says, oh, by the way, I can't smell. Like I never, like I, that's not a sense. I was like, oh, okay, then use the other four, you know. Because there was a, a moment when somebody had written about a pond and a pond in their childhood uh, and she grew up near the marshes and stuff. I was like, oh, this is an opportunity to give us the, the smell of this pond. So I got excited and kind of started talking. I said, well, I would like to let you know that I can't actually smell. I was like, oh, okay, forget everything. I'll just say it. So the rest will then think through the smells of their childhood, their grandma's home. And they're like, well, I, I think I have a poem. I used to spend holidays with my grandma and her kitchen smelled so different. Like I've never been in a kitchen that's like that. I was like, write that. So each person finds what then to run with just using the senses. When you read poem has a lot mm -hmm. of form. Poetry is about form. Human creation is about form. Creation in general is all about form. That's where we're always headed. All you have to do is look at the springtime, the emerging spring, and you'll see form everywhere. It's even mathematical, really. Yeah. When you are developing your poetry and you're moving toward the end form, how much attention do you pay to the structure, the line breaks, the traditional revision approaches? that people have heard about, but tend to be a little shy about because they don't know if they know enough to do that. Mm. That usually comes in last. 
The initial writing, I want to know what the form is going to be. I'll begin writing and just breaking the lines where I feel like I need to break. But after I have written it, I'll look at it again and then see if form can be improved upon. It's one of the places I always go to when it comes to revision. Form is what I'm usually revising. Sometimes I'll look at a poem and say, like, okay, I like the content, but this is not the right form. It's often a feeling and it's also visually inspired. I'll look at the page and won't like it. So the poem I've read is actually couplets and how they came about is that I think I had just one body initially, one long stanza. And then I thought of what the spiders do when they are making a web. You know, the lines are very sharp. The lines in, in a spider's web I was like, oh, I think I need to emphasize the lines and the spacing. Usually there's like a box. And, and then I was like, oh, then the couplets would be the best form for this poem because by having like two, two lines and then a break that space would be that space you see in a spider. And once I got that, I was like, great, this makes me happy. This is the right form. So that's how I decide form. I think of the subject, the content, and how form can amplify content and also how content is helping me to shape form. And that's how it happens. Other times I'll read something that's very stable, very solid, very grounded, and then I'll realize, oh, this needs to be one structure, like one tall standing bear, you know, standing man. Or whatever. Then if I had broken it up in several stanzas, I may decide to make it one big stanza because the content really is calling for that. Other times I'll have, you know, a stanza that each is four lines. Other times I'll have really uneven stanzas. And I realize that the subject I'm working with is very shifty, very uneven. And it's like dreamlike. I do have sometimes scenes that come from the dreams and they bleed into waking life and, you know, create, become catalysts for what happens in the day. So when that happens, I want to maintain the structure of a dream and, and the surrealness of it. And then I'll think about the kind of form that would incorporate or facilitate that. And then I'll make leaps between stanzas. Because in, in dream form, when you're dreaming, one minute you're by the river, the next minute you're in the kitchen. And, and, and there's never a question of how did I get here? So I will also write the poem that has dreamscapes. I will be describing something like that's in the kitchen and then the next thing could be something that happened in the past. I will make really a jump, but I'll make sure that the jump doesn't give somebody a seizure. <laughs> it's still acceptable. It makes sense. It makes the logical sense of dreams because that's how we make leaps. That's how we jump. We never question, where did the bed go in a dream? The, the bed is never there, you know? So there are things that then I put into the poem that bring in the surreal element and also the absurdity. You think about life in general is really surreal, is really absurd, is ridiculous sometimes. There isn't a big difference between the dream life and the wakefulness. You've reminded me that each poem on the page mm -hmm. is like a photograph and the lines are worthy of thinking of as strands in the spider's web because mm -hmm. the spider's web is different each time the spider spins it. Never the same form. And yet we always think of spider webs as if we know what they look like. And yet mm -hmm. if they haven't been made, how could we possibly know what they look like? So the poem on the page is like a little painting Yes. when you think of it from a form point of view. Yes, that's a perfect way to really say it. So as we reach the end of our time together, please tell me how people can get in touch with you and say a few closing words about poetry to take us out. Okay, thank you so much. And again, I'm really grateful for being here with you, having this conversation. So thank you for having me. 
And I have a website blog, uh, which is www.mildredbarrier.com. There's a lot of my work also that has, has been published elsewhere that is on the website. And then, uh, so that's one way to really get in touch with me. And then my books, uh, the latest one, The Animals of My Earth School, came out of Terrapin Books. So that's available either from Terrapin Bookstore or from from the independent bookstores and also Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And yeah, I think that's how people can get to know more about my work and my world. And then about poetry, I do believe that everyone is born creative. And it's just a matter of getting started. So people out there who might be listening and say, well, I could never really write a poem or I have no idea how to write a poem. If you can just trust that you were born creative and maybe you haven't had a chance to exercise that creativity, I would challenge those people to get a journal and just start writing what comes into their minds and before then, and also really being fully into their senses and using them, then they will realize that they can begin to write and express themselves in new ways and also see the world in new ways. Well, Mildred, thank you ever so much for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, welcome. And there you go, my friends. Thus concludes my conversation with Mildred Baria. We have a little more time till the top of the hour, and with that time, I would like to reflect on the difference between writing by hand and using the keyboard on your computer. I'm thinking about this contrast because of Mildred's comments about her exchange with the buck when she was in the forest. The buck put its foot forward, Mildred put her foot forward, they both leaned in acknowledgement of each other. Something about, something about Mildred's foot moving forward, along with the buck's hoof moving forward, bucks have hooves, not feet, made me think about how much I enjoy writing by hand versus typing on the computer keyboard. I'll be the first to admit that I love typing. I learned how to type when I was in high school in the 10th grade. So I've always been very proud that I know the keyboard, ASFD, JKL, semicolon. So I don't have any problem with typing, and I still like to do it. That said, when I write by hand, I feel more connected, more organic, more in the rhythm of the things around me, more in the natural flow of things like Mildred and the buck on the trail in the woods. Another reason I like to write by hand is because when I hold my pen, it reminds me I'm connected to my body, whereas when I'm typing on a keyboard, all my fingers are moving and often they go very fast, and often my fingers get so ahead of what I'm trying to think that I get confused and I have to slow down, go back, revise, etc. And I'm constantly typing, clickety, 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 and going back and revising, and I get so wound up in some sort of spiraling wheel, a bit like a hamster running around and around and around, that I forget the creative process, the writing process. The idea of putting something on the page is more akin to the deer slowly moving its leg across the forest floor, or the stream rolling downhill. Now, admittedly, some streams go fast. The waterfall is very fast. Then the stream goes placid again. So the ink coming out of the pen suggests stream, suggests flow, suggests the deer's leg, whereas the tappity, 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 tappity across the computer keys, it's almost like rat-a-tat, tat, 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 an off-syncopated drum beat that requires some kind of swirling confusion, at least on my part. Another thing you may have noticed when you type on the keyboard, your words scroll across the screen and each word, each letter looks exactly the same as the rest. It's uniform. They have absolutely no personality at all. Conversely, when I write by hand, each word, each letter has its own little personality and the letters and the words change second by second, letter by letter, word by word. If the room is, when the room is cool, the words look a certain way on the page. When the room is warm, they look different. If I'm tired, 
my writing may be scrunched up. When I'm relaxed, the words just flow across the page and are easy to read. Often people will tell me they like to type because they think fast and want to catch everything, which is legitimate on one level. On the other hand, slow thinking, like slow food, slow gardening, the slow pace of the natural world, may have more value than all of those speedy thoughts you have that you're trying to catch as you clickety-click across the typing board. You have to wonder, does all that speed actually accomplish what you'd like to accomplish, which is catch all the thoughts so that you don't lose anything? And yet, in all that fast-paced speed, you might be losing more than you're trying to catch, and you just aren't aware of it. One of the things I gain when I write by hand is a broader range of focus. When I'm writing on the computer, my eyes are on the screen. My eyes are on my fingers. I'm connected to the machine. When I'm writing by hand, I'm connected to the air. I'm connected to the room. I'm more aware of everything around me. I slow down. I watch the ink flow across the page. I feel the way the pen moves across the page. I feel the way my hand moves. A friend of mine named Susie Shipman once told me, your hand has nerves along its edge, and when you write by hand, those nerves get stimulated, and that excites your creativity, your imagination. Another thing that happens when I write by hand, and I really like this a lot, things get really, really messy. Sometimes I can't read my writing. You don't see that on the computer screen when you type on the keyboard. Things really never get messy. On the page, things do get messy when you're flowing your ink across that page. And I think that's valuable because within that mess, there's an opportunity to relax, to celebrate the messiness, to enjoy the messiness to not really give a hoot whether the periods are in the right place or the commas or whether you spell anything right or not or how you make your marks. It's free form. Liberty, freedom, a sense of spirit, a sense of openness, a sense of free range running. And then after you get all that free range writing and running done, then you can bring your computer keyboard into play. I will tell you that I will often write freehand on the page, then I will dictate what I write onto a sound file, and then I will drop it into a transcription service and let the transcription service create the text. So I often skip the keyboard until the very, very last. So after the transcription service has created the text, I'll take that text, put it on the page, and then use the keyboard to edit it. So there are a lot of ways to do this. Starting with the freeform writing, however, always guarantees that you will begin in the imaginative space and you will move toward the form space. You can think of it as writing from the imaginative storm to the creative form. And when you're thinking about writing on the page, using your pen, taking it easy, remember Mildred's story about walking in the forest, seeing the buck. The buck acknowledges her with the leg and the hoof forward. She acknowledges the buck with her foot and her leg forward, and they bow. So in a sense, you're bowing to your creative destiny by writing by hand. It's a bit like waving a magic wand, which is another story. On that note, I would like to say thank you ever so much for listening to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave. We always broadcast first on WPVMLP, Asheville 103.7, and stream online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville, heard all over the world, and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, coming out of Taos, New Mexico. I'd like to thank Mildred for bringing us the story of the buck and the feet moving forward in the forest, riding freehand. I'd like to also thank Walter 
Walter Parks for our theme song, WalterParks.com, for more on Walter's music. Davine Dial, thank you for managing WPVM-FM in Asheville on Wall Street. I appreciate it. We couldn't do this without you. Robin Cawley here, thank you for managing KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio in Taos, New Mexico. I'd like to remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project, a creative collaboration between my creative collaborator, Allegra Houston, and yours truly, James Nave, right here. TheImaginativeStorm.com is an excellent place to go if you are interested in improving your writing jobs. You'd like to make your writing a little bit more lively, a little bit more energized, a bit more imaginative, Understand the narrative arc of things? How about that memoir? What story do you have to tell? ImaginativeStorm.com. That's a good place to start. If you feel like you want to tell a story and you want to do it on the page, and yeah, you guessed it, we do advocate writing on the page freehand with a pen, a pencil, or whatever writing tool you have. And we love to read our work as well, so there's much to be found at ImaginativeStorm.com. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you again for tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio. I really do appreciate it. And hey, wherever you are in the world, I hope I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line.